Hello. Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to the ArrayJet webinar series. It's our first series, uh, first webinar in the series. Um, today we'll be introducing high density protein arrays and affinity proteomics. Um, thank you for all attending today. I hope everyone is safe and well and managing to cope in these testing times. I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, we have some familiar names uh, on the call today, some existing clients, users, uh, and some partners, as well as people who are completely new to ArrayJet. So I hope you all find the presentations uh, informative and useful. This is our first webinar of a new series of presentations aimed to provide an insight in some of the key areas where microarrays are being used and the fascinating research that is taking place across the globe. We want to provide a platform to share concepts, methods, applications and interests, and we hope that it will give you some new insights and thoughts about how you're approaching your research. With this in mind, if you have any suggestions for future webinars or areas where you'd like more, more information or have a particular topic in mind, please let us know at the end of the presentations and we'll add up to a list of future webinars and workshops. We'll also be sending a questionnaire or be using a poll within the, um, the webinar. Um, so please let us know how we did, areas for improvements or suggestions. Uh, and this is our first one, so we are learning and any feedback will be really greatly appreciated. So on to today's presentations. I would like to thank uh, both Ronald and August for agreeing to, uh, to work with us on this. They are from the Autoimmune Profiling Facility at the world famous Science for Life Laboratory in Stockholm, Sweden. So thanks for agreeing to share your applications and research with us. So Ronald has been working with, with us um, and with high density protein arrays for over a decade, originally using it as part of the Human Protein Atlas project to validate antibodies, but now focuses purely on the profiling of autoantibody responses. His presentation today will focus on the methods and the platform that have been developed for autoimmune profiling, uh, whereas August, uh, who is part of Peter Nielsen's group at the KTH uh, Scilife Lab um, Autoimmunity Profiling Group, is going to present uh, how this plat platform is actually being applied in real world re research and investigating the role of the immune system in psychotic disorders, along with other techniques and other um, platforms. So we hope you enjoy the talks and find them useful and informative. Um, we're expecting the presentations to last uh, just about an hour, um, and then we'll have a Q&A section at the end. So my colleague Ira Lopez is listening in and is going to be collating all the questions or queries that you might have. Um, and if you type those questions in the Q&A, then we'll be able to pick those up at the end of the webinar. So for those who, of you who don't know who we are or are new to ArrayJet, I'll just give you a quick introduction to us uh, and what we do. So. ArrayJet is a complete end-to-end -end microarray solutions provider. Um, originally, we made instrumentation, uh, but we've expanded our business to cover um, a number of different services and products, uh, from our instruments to um, our ArrayJet Advanced Services, which is um, uh, available for hire, basically our scientists, uh, our expertise, uh, and our machinery. Uh, we also offer a wide range of consumables and expertise. Uh, we're the industry leader in non-contact biological printing, and we have the fastest platform uh, and printing speeds available on the market. Um, we aim to be a long-term development partner with experienced teams of scientists, engineers, um, and salespeople to help you, help you with your projects and assist you as you look to um, develop array-based techniques. Uh, we're also 13485 ISO accredited, uh, so we can work with both um, research only and diagnostic approved um, products. So I'd like to first pass over to Ronald, and um, Ronald, if you can take the screen, please. Ah, so now can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you now. Ah, thank you. I had some issues here. Now, my name is Ronald Schaber, um, and I'm head of facility here at the Autoimmunity Profiling Facility in, in uh, Silaflan. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about uh, uh, the protein fragments that we use um, for the production of our microarrays and, and uh, how we use them. Uh, so we'll start with uh, talking a little bit about protein atlas, uh, which we will get our affinity reagents from. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the protein fragments, or as we call them, protein epitope signature tags, or PRESTs for short. Uh, and also about the PREST arrays, so the tools and instruments to make these. Uh, and the Scilife Lab autoimmunity prof profiling facility, the kind of QC we do on our race and uh, some of the pre-designed antigen sets that we use. And, and uh, I will end with a little bit about COVID-19, which is kind of hot right now. Uh, and then some acknowledgements. So the human protein atlas, I think you, most of you know what the human protein atlas is, but uh, to short recap, it started uh, about, I think in 2003, uh, with the aim of mapping the presence of whereabouts of all the proteins in human tissues. Uh, and now today, uh, there is a multiple atlases in the protein atlas. There's tissue atlas, cell atlas, cancer atlas, or pathology atlas, uh, brain atlas, and so on. And this is a continuing uh, uh, project that's still ongoing. Uh, Yes, and uh, in the beginning, most of it was based on the production of antigens to make antibodies to do immuno immunohistochemistry uh, to map the, 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 the location of these proteins. Uh, so a lot of antigens have been designed, a lot of antibodies have been produced. There's about 43,000 different antigens uh, corresponding about to about 19,000 genes, which means that we have about two antigens per gene, at least. Uh, and there's also about 50,000 uh, array verified antibodies. And all these affinity regions are available to us. Uh, and in the autoimmunity profiling facility, we use the antigens for autoimmunity profiling. In Nilsson lab as a whole, we also use antibodies for protein profiling, etc. So these antigens then, they have been designed so that they should be protein fragments of about 20 to 200 amino acids. Uh, they should have a low homology to, to the rest of the proteins or the rest of the genes. Uh, they avoid transmembrane regions and signal peptides and so on. They're also connected to a tag that has a, a 6 histidine and an albumin binding protein. And this albumin binding protein comes from uh, streptococci, uh, well, gram positive bacteria, such as streptococci. And as you can see there to the, to the right, the length of these fragments is uh, in mean 81 amino acids, uh, but most of them are between them 20 and uh, about 150, I guess, there. So the PRESTO race then, they started developing these in 2003, uh, doing simple dot blots. And this then turned out to actually function. And then the decision was made to buy a, a printer. So the in first printer was a ring and pin printer. Uh, and this then was used uh, to make the initial arrays for the protein atlas. Uh, the race at that time was about 72 antigens, up to 144, I think, expanded to. Uh, but of course, the ring and pin printer system was not really able to keep up with the, the demand, so to speak, for the uh, validation of the antibodies. So in 2006, we purchased our first non-contact printer. Uh, this was a, a non-contact printer using uh, glass uh, microcapillaries. Uh, and this allowed us then to do 384 uh, protein fragments in each of, of each subarray. Uh, that was then something we also grew out of eventually. And in 2010, we purchased 
an irradiate uh, marathon from an irradiate marathon uh, and this allowed us then to increase the number of subarrays on the slide to a set of 21 subarrays on each glass slide and we used that for, until last year when we bought a new uh, radiate super marathon marathon and going from these previous printers to these marathon uh, we realized that we could start saving our uh, print plates that had been impossible previously since the print the printing took so much time that we the liquid actually evaporated during printing uh, but using then the, the glycerol rich uh, buffer that is used for with a uh, radiant uh, system we could save the, the the plates and start making larger arrays so in 2012 we made what we call an 11k which was 11,000 uh, protein fragments then in two subarrays and then in 2013 we did it 21k and then in 2015, we did the first attempt at printing all the uh, protein fragments we had and available at that time. So that was the 42K array, which is really two times 21K since it's spread out over two uh, slides. So these 42K arrays, they, then they have 42,100 unique pressed, which map then to approximately 19,000 genes. They have no immunoglobulin domains in them, which is a good thing if you're doing autoimmunity profiling since your, your uh, secondary antibodies won't bind to, to the spots. Uh, they have a, about the 36% redundancy due to the fact that these are all print plates we use during uh, the printings for the validation of the antibodies. And at that time, we printed batches of 384, uh, antigens every third or uh, second week uh, and then we save the plates and sometimes uh, some antigens would fail or maybe the the, the antibodies failed in their, their experiment the first initial experiment and then we had to redo it so some of the antigens are multiple uh, present in multiple plates so we have quite a lot of spots that are unnecessary so to speak about 5% of these spots are also without an ensemble gene ID nowadays since ensemble has updated their, their uh, what they consider to be uh, genes and so on and then the connection is lost from the from the antigens and these have been printed then using 149 uh, 384 way plates and these printing plates then have been amassed under a long period of time and they're an ending resource and it's a sort of a logistic challenge to redo all these plates. Uh, so the current sets of slides that we printed have about 28% failed or no ensemble ID, which means that we are in a great need of a new version of these. Uh, it was planned to be uh, something for this year. Unfortunately, we have encountered somewhat different conditions right now. Uh, so we have pushed this forward until at least 20 oh, sorry 2021 not 21 21 uh, but we hope at least to have then a new uh, 40k array maybe uh, with zero percent redundancy and hopefully at, at least in the beginning uh, with zero percent uh, spots without an ensemble gene id uh, and this would then fit in about 111 micro l well, uh, 384 well plates so at the autoimmunity profiling facility uh, we offer services then to, to not just the Swedish academia, but you know, also international academia and industry. Uh, SciLife Lab as a whole, is the idea is to serve as a, a center and a resource for the molecular life science for Swedish academia. Uh, but we are not limited to Swedish academia. Uh, and we in the autoimmunity profiling facility then offer auto, auto antibody profiling, epitope mapping, antibody validation or other affinity binder validation uh, and also help with commercial protein arrays. Uh, we are of course associated then to a research lab, the Nielsen lab. Uh, and you can see our homepage there and, and uh, uh, web address and email. 
I did a little bit of a word cloud here over the uh, the project names that for the projects of the of during 2018 and 19, and it, it tells us tells you quite a lot of what we actually do. It's profiling and screening of autoantibodies in autoimmunity and IgG. Uh, so between 2018 and 2019, we initiated 72 projects. The main research areas of the users are either neurology or autoimmunity. Uh, and looking at the map there, you can see that most of the users are located either in Sweden or in, in Europe. But we also have users in the US, in South Korea and Australia. Uh, below there, you can see the, the pie chart here, which show that most of our users come from Karolinska Institute, which is kind of natural since we're actually sit situated in the middle of Karolinska Institute. Uh, we have also a large number of users from uh, KTH, which is our home uh, university, of course. Uh, but we also have quite a lot of international uh, users. And of the international users, four or equal amount is from US, uh, Great Britain and Germany. So to make these uh, planar arrays, we have some tools and instruments uh, that is based around uh, the Arrayjet Super Marathon. Uh, this replaced during the summer an old upgraded marathon. Uh, and together with this instrument, we also uh, bought the Jetmosphere, uh, Jetmosphere Max uh, to be able to have a controlled environment for the uh, arrayer. Uh, our old uh, instrument was standing in the room together with uh, humidifiers and dehumidifiers uh, so that we could try to maintain the humidity and, and the environment in the room. Uh, and that was kind of a not optimal solution. So we are happy that you could, that this option with a, getting a whole small box for the instrument is um, offered. With this new instrument, we ordered a, a, 20, a 32 nozzle jet spider. And the, the old version that we had was a 12 nozzle jet spider. So we hope that this will be at least twice as fast as previously. Uh, we haven't had time to do extensive testing on that, but uh, considering the fact that it take up uh, two and a half times or so uh, more samples per uptake, it should be uh, quite a, a much less time necessary for all the washing. Uh, it fits 100 slides and 48 plates uh, per loading. So for the 42k arrays, usually when a user comes to us, uh, they don't really know what they're looking for or, or how they want to approach the project. So we usually recommend them that they try maybe maximum four arrays to begin with, with pools or a few samples. Um, this is because we have found that uh, it's not, you know, in order to, to get a lot of information, you have to have a lot of samples and you can't really run 300 samples on these large arrays. It would take a lot of time and it, a lot of resources for us and would cost an enormous amount of money. Uh, so we prefer then if they do pools on the smaller arrays to be on, on the larger arrays to begin with. Uh, we do pre-incubation with free uh, his 6 avp of course, to block off any uh, antibodies in the samples towards this uh, albumin binding protein since it's uh, present in streptococci. And a lot of people have been uh, infected by streptococci at some point in their life. Uh, we use a, a lifter slip then to, uh, to create a small chamber on top of the ray uh, and this very small chamber uh, fits approximately 85 microliters, uh, which means that we need a very small amount of sample, about one microliter per sample. We also have the previously produced 384 uh, pre-made semi-random subsets uh, of, of uh, protein fragments that we used in the in the protein atlas antibody validation. These have then 21 subarrays, and together with this 96 well slide holder, uh, it's possible to run about 80 samples per project. You can use more more holders, of course. You can uh, automate using uh, liquid handling robots, but we found that if you want to do more than 
what fits in one of these, you, it's easy to go for beads. Uh, for the readout, we have used, we have, I think we're buying now our fourth scanner. Uh, this is the Inopsis InnoScan 1100 auto loader. It has a three color readout and a 0 0.5 micrometer resolution. Uh, we also have a capital bio scanner, which we have been using for many years now. And actually today I took our old nimble gen scanner or which is a rebranded Tiken scanner down to the recycling room. For the bead arrays, then we use Luminex microspheres in the Luminex system. Uh, this allows us to do a 384 times 384 multiplexing. Uh, and doing multi batch analysis enable us to do analysis of large sample cohorts. Uh, in this case, also we do pre-incubation with free his six ABP. Of course, it requires a little bit more of sample, but it's still just a few microliters, so it's a very small amount. Uh, and today we have five Luminex FlexMap 3Ds. Uh, we also have them for liquid handling, both for the flex maps, of course, and also for the planar arrays. Two TK and Freedom Evo, uh, and one TK and Fluent, and two plate washers from Biotech. Uh, and this gives us a theoretical capacity of about 14,000 samples per week. A typical user project looks something like this. They come to us, uh, they often don't know exactly what they're looking for, so they don't have a list of antigens they're interested in. Uh, so we suggest that they do a pool, so small set of proteins on these large arrays. Uh, we do the lab work and we scan the arrays, do the image analysis and take out the, the data and do QC. And then we run the, re we generate a report for the users. Uh, and then the users get to do a selection of antigens. And the selection of antigens depend of course on what kind of questions they want to ask regarding their set, their sample sets. Uh, and this is something we try to not be too involved with because we don't want to influence the users too much. Uh, once they had done the selection of antigens, uh, they come back to us uh, quite often and want to do a, a, a targeted bead array with the individual samples for the co full cohort. Uh, so we couple the, the antigens of interest uh, to beads and we run all the samples. Uh, we write the report similar to what we did for the, the plain arrays. Uh, we give the, give the report back to the users and then the users get to analyze this, this themselves and decide what they want to do as a next step. Sometimes they come back to us and they want to add new cohorts or just increase the number of, of patients or samples. Sometimes they are interested in specific antigens and specific samples, maybe like I want to do, for instance, epitope mapping to see exactly what epitope is, is uh, binding. Uh, other times they want to do orthog orthogonal methods and they might go on to another facility or, or so on. So for the QC of the planar arrays, uh, we do a lot of, of uh, visualization to see uh, what the data looks like. We start by doing a filtering of data where we filter off, of course, the flag features, uh, or remove also the, the features that have too few pixels uh, or those that are too close to the background in the, in the, in the green channel, of course, the, the quality control channel, so to speak. Uh, and we filter off all the bad replicates. Uh, we start with doing just a bar plot for the initial overview of the data, uh, followed by image plots then for visualizing the effect of the local background on the foreground. So if you see a pattern in the background, in local background from the slide, uh, that is also visible in the foreground, you might want to do a background subtraction. Uh, otherwise, you try to avoid doing a background subtraction. You also do box plots then for detecting plates effect. Uh, and this is actually a very nice box plot where it kind of looks quite good. Uh, we do a distribution plot of the data in both channels, of course, as well to look at uh, if there are 
unexpected bumps in the data, so to speak, an unexpected distribution that is present in both the red and the green. Uh, it might be, if it's not corrected by, for instance, background subtraction, you might want to do concentration dependent analysis uh, instead of just looking at the raw MFI. We prefer to keep it as simple as possible. So if it's possible to just look at the MFI, uh, we prefer to suggest that to users. Uh, otherwise, we might suggest that maybe you should uh, look at the concentration dependent uh, analysis instead. For instance, we report a number of these different uh, uh, variants, so to speak, to them. We also do a general overview of the array. Uh, you can see the signals, you can see the global background, you can see any filtering effects, just to get the feeling for how well uh, the arrays have uh, performed. Uh, and if we can see that this is not something that we can actually uh, use, we just redo the experiment. We, the slides for us are uh, a resource that we are not too careful with, so uh, we can spend a little bit of them. For the bead arrays, we do a coupling test, of course, to make sure that the antigens have coupled correctly to the beads. Uh, if the coupling have been bad, we sometimes recouple a subset of the beads. Uh, having one or two antigens not coupled well is not that uh, unusual, uh, especially for the older antigens. Uh, but if a large number of uh, of antigens couple badly, we try to to redo that. Uh, we'll also do a, a test for uh, for uh, human IgG in the sample. If IgG is what we're looking for, uh, we do a, t a test for human IgG. Uh, so we have an anti-IgG couple to be, uh, and we'll make sure that the, there's actually IgG in the correct amount uh, in the sample, so that no sample have been lost during transfer or so on. Uh, we do a bead count to make sure that we have enough data points for each bead in each sample. sample. Uh, and we look at the replicates, uh, the internal controls that we have to make sure that they don't deviate from each other. Now, the prests, of course, have been produced over a very long time. And this uh, gives some interesting effects, especially when you have made print plates that have been in the freezer for quite some time and maybe used multiple times. Uh, so there are time associated characteristics, I would say. So looking at uh, this, for instance, you have four different batches of arrays. Uh, in the beginning, on the x-axis, you have the date of cultivation for the antigen. Uh, and in the batch number one there, the one to, uh, at the top, uh, to the left, you can see that the, the MFI increases between 2003 and 2009. Uh, and exactly why it increases, uh, I'm not sure, but after 2009 to, well, 2014 or whatever, when the last one was produced, uh, the MFI is somewhat stable. Uh, and we think that that might depend on the fact that between 2003 and 2009, the uh, concentration of the fragment we got was 0 0.4 milligrams per milliliter. And then we diluted that 10 times to 0 0.04 when we print them. Uh, but after 2009, it's 0 0.8. Uh, and it seems that the high concentration uh, retains its quality uh, much better over the time. Over time. Uh, and you can also see the deterioration of print plates between batch one and batch uh, three, for instance, where a lot more uh, of the antigens are basically lost and losing all their, their uh, signal. Uh, batch five is some uh, secondary uh, set of plates that have been uh, maybe uh, mishandled a bit and that uh, acts quite strangely. So the MFI, of course, uh, the, the result is affected by the concentration of the antigens. Uh, the instrumentation that we used at the time that they were pipetted into plates, uh, the usage of the plates and the storage time of the plates. Uh, and this is then the reason, partly the reason why it's so urgent for us to actually make new arrays, a new set of arrays uh, with more fresh plates. 
Uh, luckily enough, we have access then to the internal uh, protein atlas limb system. Uh, we have all the connections to the fragment char characteristics, such as the, the sequence, uh, the, the, the weight, the, uh, the concentration, the mapping. That means that the amino acids uh, on the uh, target proteins uh, that they are uh, uh, situated uh, between. And we also have all the access to all the external database connections uh, to Uniprot and Ensemble, etc. And this is a great help for us uh, for explaining what we do to the users and to to help them find the the, uh, the correct uh, uh, fragments. So, uh, of course, using fragments is uh, uh, not the same thing as using full link proteins and uh, quite often asked how they compare and have to say that we actually don't really know. We have done some tests and tried to observe what happens when we analyze stuff on, on uh, fragments and then on full link proteins. Uh, but it does, it seems like it's more complex than just if it's fragments or full link proteins. And this is, this kind of visualizes that we have, we tried a few samples on our own fragment arrays, U protoarrays and protoarrays, uh, and together the, these three different uh, platforms have about 6,300 uh, uh, uniprot IDs in common. Uh, and then looking at the samples, what they show reactivity to on these uh, three different platforms, there's quite a little overlap, both between the the full length protein arrays and the fragment arrays, uh, as well as between the, the, the two full length protein arrays. Uh, we're not exactly sure why that is, but it, it's something that we we'll always try to, uh, to highlight and, and uh, explain to our users that uh, we cannot promise that you will have a, a folding in uh, our fragments, the correct folding. The fragments are long enough to in most cases to uh, produce at least some folding, but it might not be the correct one. Um, now we also have some pre-designed antigen sets. Uh, we have an autoimmunity array that consists of 375 fragments from known or suspected autoantigens. Uh, this is quite uh, popular among some users uh, to, because that gives them a, a, a fixed set that they might be interested in without having to first go through the large array. So that saves some time and some money. Uh, we have also recently uh, produced a secretome array, which has then about 2000 full length proteins that are known or believed to be secreted. These have not yet uh, been offered to uh, to external users. Uh, we were hoping to be able to do that this spring, but it seems to be something maybe for the autumn uh, or winter. Uh, right now, uh, we're working on the COVID-19 array uh, consisting of commercially available plus then in-house produced full length proteins and fragments or rather produced at the uh, Human Protein Atlas protein factory, so to speak. Uh, and for this, we'll be using them to to screen for antibodies against viral proteins. Uh, and the goal with this is to then generate about 150 variants of these uh, proteins uh, and to uh, then over the spring and early summer analyze personnel at all the major emergency hospitals here in Stockholm. Uh, and then also to move on to other personnel in healthcare and elderly care. Uh, and we've gotten a lot of external funding for this to buy reagents and increase our instrumental capacity, which means that out of the five Luminex systems that we have now in the lab, uh, three was actually installed yesterday. Uh, so we will be running about 50,000 samples probably uh, before the, the beginning of summer here. Uh, this then means that we will have about uh, a capacity of about 14,000 samples per week in May. Uh, and so far, the, the results look very, very, very promising. So I would like to acknowledge then the, all the, especially our funding foundations and industry collaborators, uh, the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Stiftelse, the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Fund, 
uh, the Human Protein Atlas, uh, the Erling Persson Foundation, of course, um, Atlas Antibodies, Silaflab in general, Rayjet, of course, uh, and also the whole Nilsson lab headed by Professor Peter Nilsson, uh, and the five members of four plus me <laughs> in the autoimmunity profiling. Now, I would like to uh, give the word to uh, Reynold again. Thank you very much, Ronald. That was a really interesting overview of your work. Um, I've got lots of questions, but we can save that for the end. Um, just before we pass over to the next one, I'm just about to launch a poll. Um, so if you can just, when you get the chance, it just sits in the background, if you can uh, take some time to answer those questions. Uh, also, there will be a Q&A session, uh, session at the end of this. Uh, at the bottom of your menu bar, you should be able to see a Q&A. Uh, and if you can post questions there, we can ask them to both Ronald and August at the end of the um, presentations. So next person up is uh, August Yenoburn Falk, who works with, in the Peter Nielsen Group. Um, although he has used our instrument before, he is more involved in um, the, the application of the, the, the platform and um, how it can be used. So uh, I'm going to pass across now to, to August uh, and then afterwards we'll commence with the Q&A ses um, session. Uh, and please, yeah, if you can fill out the poll, that'll be really, really useful. So uh, over to you, August. Thank you very much, Ronald. So. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is August Jan Falk, and uh, as Ronald mentioned, I'm a PhD student in the Nilsson Lab at SciLife Lab and KTH Royal Institute of Technology. So at the Nilsson Lab, we perform, as Ronald mentioned, both autoimmunity profiling and protein profiling. And the project that I will present today to showcase the 42K arrays is an autoimmunity profiling project that's called Exploring Autoantibody Profiles in Psychiatric Disorders. So you might wonder what's the relationship between psychiatric disorders and autoimmunity? Well, actually, there is a growing body of evidence in autoimmune involvement in psychiatric disorders. The main showcase of this is uh, the case of NMDA receptor encephalitis, where autoreactivity to a single receptor in the brain causes a whole spectrum of symptoms that's specific for this uh, encephalitis. And these patients become psychotic, but uh, upon re receiving antibodies, um, antibody therapy, they become uh, well again. Behind all psychiatric disorders, there is a poor understanding of the underlying patho pathophysiology, um, and this leads to a symptomatic treatment, of course. This is very unfortunate since uh, these diseases are highly debilitating and poses a huge burden on both the individual, its caretakers, and society. Uh, and uh, with this in mind, the aim here was to explore the IgG repertoire in patients with psychotic disorders to reveal potential disease-associated autoantibodies. In this project, we had access to plasma samples, which we first screened on a planner array, followed by a suspension bead array approach, uh, similar to what Ronald presented in the usual uh, user pipeline. Samples were kindly given to us by our collaborators Oliver Schubert and Sherry Gallatly at the University of Adelaide in Australia. These are blood plasma samples from 473 patients, and they were collected within the Survey of High Impact Psychosis, or SHIP, that was conducted in Australia uh, a few years ago. This is a very well-characterized cohort with uh, 462 variables available to us, such as age and gender, diagnosis, of course, medical history, drug abuse, and many others. And that makes this a very valuable um, cohort for us to investigate. 
So starting off, we wanted to perform a broad screening to explore the autoimmune landscape within this cohort. Doing that, we used the 42K arrays that Ronald presented. And as he also mentioned, they have a quite low throughput with only one sample or sample pool per array. And we can't use uh, 473 uh, planner arrays for this work, so we construct sample pools to provide a broad representation of the cohort. In this case, our collaborators shows sets of four individuals, eight sets, that were clinically distinct from each other to provide a broad representation of the cohort. Now, the image to the right here is the data generated by the uh, pool number one on the 42K arrays. So this is the layout, the actual layout of the 42K arrays. And this data is after quality control uh, as per the um, method that Ronald showcased. So we wanted to select antigens. Here, those are the antigens with orange and red peaks, that's uh, the mean uh, plus eight standard deviations. And these antigens uh, combined from all of the um, eight different pools uh, were uh, 180. We combined those 180 antigens with previous in-house results, suggestions from our collaborators and literature analysis to yield 380 protein fragments corresponding to 331 proteins. Now, this list of protein fragments was used to generate a suspension bead array. This consists of color-coded microspheres. And these microspheres are also magnetic, so we can uh, handle them in a useful way. One protein fragment is coupled to each bead ID or bead color, generating a suspension bead array, which is incubated together with the samples. And here, the samples are used individually. After several incubation and washing steps, we can perform a readout in a FlexMap 3D machine. And this is kind of a flow cytometer with two lasers, one that detects the bead ID and another that detect, detects the presence or absence of fluorophore on a secondary anti-human IgG antibody that we have added. Now this generates a large data set and it becomes uh, a complex task to perform data analysis, especially since we have, in this case, 461 clinical variables av available. We have a pipeline which we usually use when we are faced with an autoimmunity profiling project like this, but it didn't quite make the cut here. Uh, so instead, we used uh, a selection procedure we were, where we selected for antigens, which had 90% symptom specificity and a significant symptom association. Here we found 13 antigens that fulfill these criteria. And an example here is in the green box to the right. That's AP3B2, which is associated to five different symptoms of psychosis. So we've got um, the presence of delusions during the patient's lifetime, uh, delusions and hallucinations that last for one week, uh, persecutory delusions, and so on. What's interesting here is that these symptoms all are uh, symptoms from the psychotic domain of symptom symptoms in psychiatric disorders. This was a pattern that we noted in 12 out of the 13 antigens selected with this procedure. So we have three antigens that are associated to uh, symptoms from the psychotic domain, four antigens associated to symptoms from the depressive domain, and another four antigens associated to symptoms from the anxiety domain. Now, this is a very interesting patterns, uh, pattern uh, since this 
could indicate the presence of uh, clinically defined subgroups that are also reactive to these groups of antigens. To investigate this further, further and reduce confounding, we removed the individuals that were cross-reactive uh, between the domains, the symptom domains. And showcasing one example here in the psychotic domain, we, we investigated uh, it further with other symptoms. So as expected, or as we hoped, the, um, the individuals reactive to these three antigens had a higher prevalence of psychosis than the other individuals. We also found an unexpected finding that these individuals had a higher prevalence of subjective thought disorder. Now, these are interesting results, but to move this further, we need to analyze uh, the presence or absence of these uh, domains in uh, other cohorts and continue evaluating this with our clinical collaborators. So in summary, we used the 42 KRA to identify 180 antigens that were reactive in patients with psychosis. In, of the 13 antigens that we finally selected, six originally came from the untargeted 42 KRA screening, which points to the usefulness of 42 KRA screening uh, in this setting. In the suspension beta array, we characterized the individual autoantibody profiles, and we selected antigens that are associated to distinct domains of symptoms of psychosis. But as I mentioned, the investigations here are currently ongoing to evaluate the clinical value of these antigen groups. With that, I'd like to thank the uh, Nilsson lab with my supervisors, Professor Peter Nilsson and Anna Monberg. Uh, and of course, Ronald for making these very nice arrays. Also our funders and our collaborators, Oliver and Sherry from the University of Adelaide. And finally, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, August. Uh, that was really, really uh, useful and interesting. I'm just gonna share my screen now. Um, one second. We're now going to move on to the q and I'd like to thank everyone who has done um, uh, the poll. That's really, really useful. We've got a couple of questions um, uh, lined up, uh, but if you do have any further questions, please just um, uh, ask it in the Q&A section. Uh, so the first question, I suppose I'll just jump into um, uh, with August is, uh, I've got a couple of questions. Where did the, the other antigens come from if they weren't identified? Um, you said that six of the 13 um, came from the, the, the 42K array. Where were the, were the other arrays from? Where were they identified from? Uh, well, they were identified in the um, other antigen selection procedures that we used, such as um, suggestions from our collaborators and uh, literature. Uh, research. Okay, and uh, were the, the ones that you identified with the array, were they known prior to that or were they complete sort of out the blue in terms of understanding, you know, did, did you have an aware, awareness that they would be uh, potentials? Uh, no, I don't think we had an awareness really. Uh, it's always hard to tell what uh, antigens will show up because this kind of broad uh, autoantibody screening isn't really performed by anyone else. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. I was really appreciated. Um, as I said, everyone can um, can answer to, can pose questions via the Q and A section. Um, uh, I've also got one from Ian. Uh, one second. I'm just trying to load this up. Uh, you'll excuse my. Uh, uh, Um, so yes, Ronald has already answered this, but I'll, I'll pose it again for everyone else. So um, this is from Ian. You mentioned some potential caveats in the reactivity relating to the protein folding, um, but how much of a consideration did you give to glycolization? I'm especially interested in to the, due to the nature of the heavily 
glycolated proteins for, of COVID-19. Uh, yes, yeah, so of course the uh, the standard protein fragments uh, used in the human protein atlas uh, do not have uh, any glycosylation. Of course, uh, they're produced in in uh, E. coli, and and uh, it has not been a, a goal to study that. Uh, uh, using those, uh, so using those, uh, we would of course not pick up any any anti any, any uh, antibodies towards uh, glycosylation. For the COVID nineteen array, the goal is to have a mix of of uh, both full length protein proteins uh, produced uh, and and fragments then produced in in uh, both uh, E. coli and and uh, uh, show uh, cells Chinese hamster ovary cells uh, and also the the ones that we currently have uh, in the initial phases now are are uh, proteins expressed in, in mammalian cells uh, that we have gotten from collaborators. I'm not 100% sure about the glycosylation of those, uh, but the goal, partly of, of the goal of, of this array is to investigate uh, the, the, the connection between, of course, the, the folding and glycosylation and, uh, and what you can uh, pick up uh, from these uh, patient samples. Uh, using, for instance, non-glycosylated uh, proteins, that would be nice to know uh, if you really need that, or or if it's uh, if it's uh, unnecessary to actually have the glycosylation uh, on these. So, so this is something that we will probably investigate using this COVID-19 array uh, to some extent. Yes. Hello, did you hear me? Oh, I've got a couple yeah. of questions for you as well. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I was still on mute. Um, <laughs> yeah, apart from the new plates, uh, they said obviously you're sort of refreshing those and redesigning the 42K array. And what else do you have on the horizon in terms of development for the array? Uh, for the 42K array, uh, we will look, would like to include better controls. Uh, the old print plates that I've been using have no controls for like orientation and so on, which makes it very, very important to get the correct orientation already when printing. So we would like to have like orientation controls, uh, positioning controls, uh, preferably also some sort of control that makes it possible to see from the spots that the plate, the correct plate is in the correct position. Uh, that would take a lot of burden away from uh, from us when we're actually doing the, uh, making the rate to know uh, that we can check these things uh, after we have actually produced the array uh, instead of <laughs> having to be like, so totally, totally concentrated on, on, on making the, everything perfect to begin with. Uh, we would also probably want to include uh, a little bit more uh, of uh, spatial controls, uh, so to speak. So you maybe replicates spread out over over the array, uh, because I, we think that having replicates right next to each other are, is quite unnecessary, uh, because if you want replicates in uh, on the array, they should be spread out a bit to to give you a better idea of of uh, the spatial uh, background effect, so to speak. Uh, so we might want to do a little bit more planning for having a, a fixed set of of replicates that allow us to to maybe do normalization if necessary, uh, even though we try to avoid. Uh, doing too much massage of the data, so to speak, uh, or, and uh, to give us a, an idea of the reproducibility of, of the printing over the array. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, there's another question as well uh, for August, um, which is how does the sensitivity uh, in the limited detection for the 42K array uh, compare to the bead arrays? And does this differ between different types of antibody, the IgG versus IgGM? Well, uh, that's a good question. First of all, uh, we are only looking at IgG 
uh, this far, far, or at least I've only been looking at IgG, so that's what I can answer for. Um, the um, sensitivity or limit of detection is uh, very much application dependent for these PRESTs that we're using, uh, or the autoantibodies that we detect. Um, so what antigens show high or low reactivity uh, on what platform uh, does not necessarily correlate, but the ones with the highest reactivity often correlate. So that's about what I can say on that. Uh, can I say a few words as well? Uh, for the, it, concerning the sensitivity or the limit detection between the plane arrays and the bead arrays, I would say that the bead arrays uh, are much more sensitive. Uh, it's, yeah, I would say that they're much more sensitive. And when it comes to IgG versus, for instance, IgM, uh, we try to use, we try to to uh, to look at IgM uh, on the planar arrays, uh, and that has not been very successful, uh, I would say. So, uh, I w if you would look at anything other than IgG, uh, I would definitely say. Oh, IgE or IgA, uh, that would be fine, suitable for the for, for the planar race, but uh, otherwise I would probably prefer to use the beta race. All right, perfect. Thank you very much again for that. Are there any further questions? We do have one. Uh, as the density of the arrays increases, would the cover slip would cover slips be useful for post processing in the entire printable area? on the slide, or would there be a need for a higher volume of sample? Uh, well, yes, if you would add more spots. Right now, it's uh, kind of a tight fit underneath the, the cover slip. So if you would add more spots, uh, we would not be able to use a cover slip. Uh, and that would then, of course, require us to use a higher volume. Uh, that would be most unfortunate, of course, because we're one of the strengths of these uh, using uh, these arrays are of course the very very small amount of, of samples that's needed um, but we are also looking into using other substrates for the next version of the array uh, and then possibly using the um, what are they called path uh, from path slides from Grace Biolab, I think they're yeah. called. And they have a thin layer of, of nitrocellulose on top of them. And then it would not be, it's not easy to use these cover slips uh, together with those arrays. We tried it and, and it's very easy to damage the surface of those arrays. Uh, so then we would anyway have to kind of move away from the cover slip. Uh, so yes, it's it's the cover slip is a limitation in some ways, yes. Okay, perfect. Well, um, thank you very much. Um, I think that's the last of the questions. I'd just like to thank everyone for attending today. Um, the video will be available online um, via our website, so I'll publish that as soon as I possibly can. If you have any further questions or queries uh, after the, um, the webinar is finished, please feel free to email me. I'm just gonna put my email address uh, up on the screen now. Uh, alternatively, you can email mail at ArrayJets. Uh, but please feel free to contact me. I can put you in contact with both August uh, and Ronald. Uh, and we can, um, if you're interested in collaborating, um, if you're interested in any of our products or services, then please feel free to reach out to myself and I'll put you in contact with the right people. Um, but I would like to thank Ronald and August. Thank you very much. It's been a really informative uh, discussion. Um, and we look forward to hosting you, um, you all at our next event, uh, which will be published on the website in the not too distant future. Um, so uh, thanks everyone. Um, is there any final comments, gentlemen? I could add uh, regarding the last question here, when I um, uh, said that we were looking into other substrates, uh, the reason why we're looking, okay. the do you hear me? Yes. The reason why we're looking into other substrates uh, uh, actually uh, is connected to the question to, to August about the IgG and IgM. Uh, we would like to be able to put more 
uh, antigens into uh, the substrate uh, to bind up more antigen to get a better sensitivity uh, for the planar arrays as well. Uh, that we hope to to be able to then combine the making the new print plates, uh, fresh ones uh, with a, a, a better substrate than what we currently use would hopefully be a, enable us to do more uh, sensitive work on the, on the plane arrays as well. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for, uh, for attending. Um, as I said, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out. Regarding the COVID point as well, we are developing a solution uh, with some of our partners uh, to do a, a, um, a planner array based solution. Uh, so if you're interested in finding out more about that, as I say, just get in contact and um, we can discuss it in more detail. Uh, thanks again, Ronald. Thanks, August. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.